So I left off by saying that the industrial revolution, the bourgeois industrial revolution is a political revolution. Uh, and no one uh, more exemplifies that, at least up until this point, uh, than Robert Peel. And let's take a look at what's going on with him. Uh, remember, Robert Peel is the guy that uh, started out in the calico printing business with his father, Parsley Peel, and then opened uh, a cotton mill, or a calico printing mill in Radcliffe outside of Manchester, and now has gotten into opening several cotton mills. Um, he is becoming fabulously wealthy although the vast majority of people are experiencing poverty like they've never seen before. Um, and Robert Peel buys a country estate and along with it, a seat in parliament, uh, because this is the way the system worked at this time. Uh, so he buys a country estate in Tamworth. This is outside of Birmingham, uh, a large city uh, next, I want to say the next city over from Manchester. I don't know my English, English geography that well, but um, it's relatively close to uh, Manchester, but uh, another major city. And um, he buys a country estate from a, you know, uh, a, a, a person of nobility, of high nobility that has fallen into the middle class and then ultimately has to sell their estate. So this is what's happening is there's these nobles falling out of high class into the middle class uh, and maybe they sell out soon enough to sustain themselves in the middle class or maybe they're even you know, falling deeper than that uh, because they're not thinking like capitalists. Uh, they're thinking like, you know, feudal lords, but that's over, uh, been over for a long time. Uh, so he buys off this large estate that used to be a fiefdom. And uh, he also buys a block of tenement housing, a block of like apartments with lots of people living in them. And um, there's no secret ballot uh, at this point in England so when you cast your vote in a parliamentary election, everybody knows how you voted. And if your landlord is paying close attention, uh, you may want to vote for him if he's on the ballot. And of course, Robert Peel was on the ballot and lo and behold, they all voted for Robert Peel. Okay, this is what is called a pocket bureau, borough. And a borough is like a, a barrio, right? Do we say barrio? Do we say borough? Um, so this is a pocket borough. Um, okay. So Robert Peel is fabulously wealthy, so much so that he can buy a, a, a fiefdom and uh, buy in, in the process, buy himself a seat in parliament. And the Poor Removal Act more trouble with the poor laws, lo and behold. Maybe there's a connection. Um, so this says, this act says no person uh, belonging to, uh, not belonging to a parish. So if somebody's like an outsider, the, some vagabond, unemployed person who comes into your parish, um, they can't be removed unless they apply for relief. If they're not applying for relief, the sheriff can't pick them up and kick them out of town. So evidently this sort of thing was going on. Um, you know, they're sort of preemptively kicking them out of town so they don't become a problem. And this law says you can't do that. Now what this indicates to me is that people are moving around the country looking for work. And um, and uh, if I remember correctly, Adam Smith, he's the big economist from about 20 years before this, wrote the Wealth of Nations, which is a standard text in, in political economy. Um, 
he argued that the poor laws, especially the laws that didn't allow um, the poor to receive poor relief anywhere except in their home parish, he argued that that actually uh, ha leads to labor shortages. Um, and I've talked about labor shortages before and why I put it in air quotes. But um, uh, so this may be a reaction uh, to what he has to say to try to modify that a little bit. Not really correcting it in the way that he suggests, but um, but doing something to help people who are moving around the country just trying to find work. Uh, because that mobility is important for the labor market so that you have lots of people showing up on your doorstep looking for work so you can drive down the price of labor as far as possible. And so that people get paid as little as possible for their labor. From a capitalist perspective, that's what you want. Um, now, in, in this time, and this is this is stretching from 1750 to 1820, and we're just about in the middle of that here. So the general trend over that period is that uh, more of the poor are of working age. So in earlier decades, there were a lot of elderly people or a lot of very young people that were um, receiving poor relief and showing up at the workhouses. But now, more of the people seeking relief are of normal working age. Now, one explanation we can have, you can obviously see here, is that, of course, children are now working far more than they ever did before. Um, and, um, but it also indicates that, there, that there's so many working age people showing up that it's overshadowing the elderly that are there. Okay. There's also more males. Um, now there are some explanations for this that I can give, uh, you know, speculation, but but maybe it makes sense. Some of this is obviously clear, like with the kids. The kids are obviously working more in the in the cotton mills, in particular. And one thing that the kids are doing is, and why kids are so important to the cotton mills is they're the only ones who can get underneath the machines and clean out all the cotton debris from underneath the machines to keep them running smoothly, um, especially when the machines are running. And so that was a major function of child labor in the cotton mills is you get the very young kids, the five, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, and you would send them under the machines to clean them out while the machines kept running. You know, you didn't stop production for this. Um, and they were even cleaning um, the moving parts of the machines while they're running. Um, And, and of course, even a little bit older girls would work just as well, probably there too, or very young girls for that matter. Um, so, you know, if there's more males receiving uh, poor relief and they're more of working age, well, there's all these kids, including girls that, uh, you know, in the past wouldn't wouldn't be uh, normally thought of as employable. And, um, and of course, then we also have an influx from Michael's uh, threshing machine of all these agricultural workers. And especially threshing is a very backbreaking uh, physical, you know, uh, like doing exercise, like working out at the gym, doing aerobics, uh, not necessarily heavy lifting, but doing, you know, repetitive. Uh, aerobic activity um, that was more of a man's job. So we have all this influx of agricultural laborers, laborers as well. 
uh, one strategy to deal with this is called the Spienhamland system. And uh, Spienhamland is a city. And what they did, decided to do, or maybe it's a county, but what they decided to do with their poor relief is um, to mean test and use a sliding scale uh, in order to supplement what working men were making um, or working families. You know, maybe the kids are working in the factory and the parents aren't even working because they can't get a job in the factory. Uh, and so then they're gonna supplement the family income sufficiently so that they can all survive. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it shows that uh, people who are working can't afford to feed their entire family. It just indicates how successfully, how what a good job the capitalists are doing at driving wages to the, to not only to the absolute minimum of survival, but below that, below that floor, so that people are not able to buy food. Um, so they're not even providing wages sufficient to reproduce the labor because they don't need to, because there's lots of unemployed people about. Um, <clears throat> and one of the problems here is there is a sharp increase in grain prices and stagnant wages. Okay, so the capitalists are driving now wages and I've you know, driven home that point. Now, grain prices are increasing because we have the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars are getting underway. So um, Napoleon is, is still a general, um, but he's about to emerge as a world historic figure. And, um, and France is engaging in lots of warfare and disrupting the flow of grain uh, from the continent to England and back and forth. You know, in this market system of food distribution, you know, England is still exporting grain, but they don't have enough grain to feed the people they have. It's just, that's the way that free markets work, work out. Um, and so these disruptions of the supply chains, as we've seen like with COVID and, and uh, this Christmas, you know, those sorts of things develop. And then once, once they set in, it's very hard to get out of a supply chain problem. Uh, and so it just becomes chronic until you can get to the root causes and then let it work its way through the system. And uh, so, so that's all going on. And then uh, Robert Peel, not only is he just fabulously wealthy, he's one of the, he's one out of 10 known millionaires in Britain. As far as anybody can tell, there's only 10 millionaires and Robert Peel is one of them. Uh, this is where the word millionaire comes from. And of course, now that seems quaint. You know, now we're talking about, we're about to move on to trillionaires. <laughs> um, so, um, so Robert Peel now is a very interesting character. His grandfather was a farmer like a regular old farmer. He owned his own property, but he worked in the field. And, uh, you know, it was a family operation where everybody worked on the farm and they did pretty well and they had a pretty big chunk of property. And so they were all right, but they were nowhere near to middle class, as I described it in the class structure uh, from this time period. But Robert Peel's father got into this calico printing business uh, because his brother-in-law went and got, did an apprenticeship in, in calico printing. And now Robert Peel 
is has all of God's money. Like he has all of the money. There's just nobody that's as rich as him. Well, there's nine other guys. Um, so uh, that's quite a change in fortune. But it's not just a change in fortune. It's a change in power. Because now Robert Peel, just in terms, just because of the quantity, again, it's this quantity becomes quality. Uh, a quantitative difference becomes a qualitative difference. So it's just a whole new, it's like changing from blue to red. It's something entirely different just by adding numbers, which we tend to think of incremental things as not changing in quality. Uh, but when you really change it very quickly, it's a whole different thing. And Robert Peel now is a whole different thing. He is um, at least becoming top dog in the whole class structure. So let, let's keep an eye on this. Um, now the revolution in France continues. Uh, now we have the directory which is under the, the new written constitution. And um, the, they are suppressing the Jacobins, that's the ropes, the a, um, radicals who were part of the reign of terror. And they're suppressing Jacobins who are kind of fighting back against the Themidorian um, uh, counter uh, revolt there and uh, the Themidorian reaction, as it's called. And um, there is a royalist conspiracy. Okay, so now we have people who wanna bring back the monarchy. Sounds familiar, right? From the whole experience with the history of England, same sort of thing going on here, back and forth. Um, and because of this royalist conspiracy, the Jacobins, gain in popularity. It's like, oh, the Jacobins were right. We gotta be more aggressive against these, these middle of the road people because they're gonna allow monarchy to come back. And so Jacobins gain seats um, uh, in, in the, the assemblies and gain seats in the councils. And the councils are like the small uh, like committees, we call them committees, they're councils, they're small groups that work on special projects. So now Jacobins are running special projects within the assembly and um, and they acquire two seats on the directory, the executive board of five members chosen by lot. And this just causes total disarray um, in the, the assembly and um, things are not functioning uh, because people are, you know, there is the fear that they're going to go back to a reign of terror sort of situation. And it was, it was, you know, really insanity. Um, so the French consulate comes on the scene and this is, this is Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, he, ex, uh, you know, executes a coup on November 10th and then has himself self installed as the first consul. And this is an old Roman word uh, for the, the, uh, the chief executive of the Roman Senate um, and what Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar himself uh, was called uh, at first. Um, <clears throat> and he turns uh, the French government into an autocratic republic, um, something like the protectorate in England that we discussed before, uh, but maybe even more so a, a, a military dictatorship. <clears throat> okay. All right, so that is that.